Greetings to you all in Jesus' precious name. All right, let's turn our Bibles uh, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 37 to verses 6 of chapter 22. We will read this portion responsively. We are journeying through the sermon series through the Gospel of Luke. We've come all the way till chapter 21, verse 37 to Chapter 22, verse 6, will be the portion that we will consider this morning. Let me read verse 7, 37. Please read the alternate verses. We'll read along till verse 6. Luke chapter 22, verse 37. And in the, in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple. And at night, he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to him in the temple for to hear him. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Verse 3. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. Verse 5, and they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Shall we pray and look to the Lord? Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for the privilege of coming to your house and worshiping you. Lord, when many in this world have not this privilege, you've called us to the true and the living God. You've made us to be in your house to not only rejoice in you, to give glory to you, but also to receive from you thy truths that we desperately need that would not only set us free, but that would uh, cause us to be preserved in thy in thy covenant and uh, would cause us, Lord, to be able to live worthy of your name that is upon our lives. Father, here we are as your people, unable, unworthy as I am to do anything, Father. I pray that you would give us the words of life that would enable us to live out a life that is pleasing to thee, a life that would bring glory and honor to thee. We pray that you would bless our time together as we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. The life of a, a stray cat is very, very different from a, a service dog, it seems. When I say that, um, I want you to imagine about the stray cat in, in India, which uh, lives very opportunistically. Uh, we have this phrase called the cat on the wall, right? If you have heard of it, uh, very opportunistic. Wherever it finds uh, a milk or an open door, an invitation, it's going to sneak in and enjoy. But unlike that, a service dog is going to be belonging to a particular house. It's not going to venture out into the other neighbor's house, even by mistake. It knows its owner. It's going to stay in the compound of the owner. Whatever the owner feeds, it eats. It even gets strained not to eat what is not supposed to be eaten. And many things go on very differently in these two animals that we find. And you might ask me, what, I, what has that got to do with uh, the, the sermon today, which will be what we will try to understand. Interestingly, that uh, there is a life that is lived in this world that seems like we are living on the wall. We are, we are trying to live on a neutral ground. We are trying to live a life that is not harmful, that is not something that would uh, cost us anything. Whenever there are opportunities here and there, little by little, we can seize them, but don't be committed to anything. Don't have to be belonging to anyone. 
and enjoy a king's life, like the life of a stray cat. It can get, it has the whole community for itself, unlike a dog that has just a compound for itself, right? And uh, I, I remember when uh, we were passing out of our engineering college, we had our friends make a souvenir or, or uh, uh, I mean, every page has each of our pictures and our famous quotes and our, our uh, interest or the, or the favorite uh, statements of life. And somebody said, I want to live a king-sized life. I want, a free, I want to live a free life. Those were some comments that uh, my colleague, my, my classmates made. Essentially, they just don't want to be confined with any boundaries. They just want to live life just uh, fully enjoying which is a general tendency, right, that we all have. Now, what we find in this portion that we're going to look at today is a very grave portion. Unlike the song that we have sung, which is Do Not Fear, I would have us take note that the most part of my sermon is we should fear a lot. Uh, but at the end, it would come back to Do Not Fear. Don't worry, I won't leave you there. <laughs> But uh, what we find here today is a portion where the one who was with Jesus for three and a half years or so, so counted among the 12, so close, so profoundly impacted, walked, and uh, so much that he got in, in the brief time um, but so quickly dragged to destruction. What is it that caused Judas Iscariot to be the man that he became to be the betrayer? Notice you would not find anyone having a name called Judas. Have you met anyone who met who called himself Judas? So much so that name had become so poignant or so coined for betrayal, right? Don't be Judas is what they would say. In fact, I heard somebody, a man of God saying, the only time he met someone with a name called Judas is someone named their pet dog as Judas, it seems. <laughs> but uh, the man of God says that that's also not a good choice <laughs> because it do doesn't go with well with a dog because a dog is known for his faithfulness rather than betrayal. So uh, whatever be it, uh, we won't hear anybody having his child or her child be naming themselves as Judas or anything else. Why is it so that we have such a, a mark for this name? What is it about this man and his sad demise and destruction of how he entered from the night where he chose to betray Christ he entered into deeper night and it, into an eternal darkness that he never would be seeing any sun. Such a grave danger that a life could so quickly go into a state of eternal darkness where there will be no more light. And that's the portion that we're going to look at today as we come to this unholy covenant, unholy covenant. Before we come into this new covenant or a holy covenant that Jesus is going to establish as he's going to bring forth the Lord's table in place, which we would look at, we would going to take a grave uh, look at this unholy covenant and how Judas had got into it. And so as we consider this, I want you to imagine yourself and myself in this three grounds that if you may think of one is called uh, the ground, which is the unholy ground. You might see the scripture as well, um, where when Moses was met by uh, Moses and the burning bush, as God meets Moses, God says to Moses, Moses, this is a holy ground. So there is a holy ground. There is a neutral ground. There is an unholy ground. And most of us in our life, we first obviously are going to start on the neutral ground. I mean, neutral ground, which we think is a neutral ground. It's not that it is neutral ground. In fact, that ground is also part of the unholy ground. 
we don't think that it is part of the unholy ground because it seems harmless, just like a stray cat, which is lingering on the wall, opportunistic, that I'm not going to belong to anyone. I'm just neutral. I'm going to just play it safe. I'm going to be on the wall and live my life as the opportunity arrives. I'm going to seize them and live my life. I don't have to be committed to anything called the holy ground. And that's usually our thought process. And so as we imagine ourselves to being on this so-called neutral ground, which is not any neutral, I want you to watch out for certain kinds of people that you and I would meet in the portion that we read. The first kind of people that you and I meet is in verses 37 and 38. They're called the people who are hearers. People who are hearers. Well, in 38 verse in Luke chapter 21, we read, And all the people came early in the morning to him in the temple for to hear him. You know, we are privileged to come to hear the word of God. So were the people of the Jerusalem and those that came to the Passover festival from all the surrounding cities and villages. And they were privileged to hear the greatest of the preachers that walked on the earth, the very God of gods, the true teacher. And they were privileged to be sitting at his feet and listening and being taught by him. You and I can be privileged to be taught by the truths of God's word that we can be enjoying it, that we could be hearing it as we read about the parable that Jesus gives to, the, to his disciples in Matthew 13, we find that there are four kinds of soils that you would find, as, ex as, exclaimed, as explained by Jesus later, that these are four kinds of hearts in the light of the hearing of God's word. These hearts are receiving the same seed, the seed of God's word, but they are different in the way they respond. And we all know the wayside hearers, the, the stony hearts or so stony heart hearers, and then the thorny heart or the thorn, uh, the hearers who belong to the ground that are like a thorny patch, and then finally the fruitful ground. Or, and so when we think about this, we find that it is not just the part of hearing that makes us blessed as much as the people that listen to Jesus, but it is what we do with what we hear that would cause us to either belong to this holy ground or the other ground. I would call it other ground, but for some time, let's park to understand that we are in the neutral ground and we need to see the grave danger of being on the neutral ground. We cannot. We cannot take any chances of continuing to be on the neutral ground, but move to this holy ground. Now, so the first kind of group that we talked about is the people who are hearers. Now come with me to chapter 22, verse 1 and 2. Particularly, we read in verse 2, And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. The second group, which they think are the neutral or again on the neutral ground, they are called people fearers. People who are hearers, people fearers. There are many in this world who do many things because they fear the people. Oh, our children are like that sometimes. They just do it because they fear the repercussions that we might give to them. Don't do this or do this. And they do it just, even if their heart is not in it, they do it just for the fear of the anger or the repercussions that would come upon them. And we might think that is a neutral ground again. People fearers. But it is part of the unholy ground where we might do some things, even as devout men as these chief priests and scribes are. Outwardly, they were the most devout men in that time. People regarded them as the elite of the elites. They were on the helm of the affairs concerning the things with regards to God. They were there when it mattered to show forth anything to do with religiosity. But they were those who feared the people. 
they are in the neutral ground and again on the unholy ground. Now, the second group is called the people fearers. The third one I would have us read verse 3, which says, Then entered Satan into Judah, sir, named Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. I call this twelve as the people who are followers. People who are followers. Yeah, the twelve were called by our Lord Jesus Christ personally to follow him. We read when he speaks to Matthew as the tax collector, he invites Matthew, who was a tax collector, a very good profession, come follow me. Come follow me. And so was it for all these twelve. They were called to follow this rabbi. Leave whatever they were doing, their professions, and follow this rabbi, and they're called people followers. Yes, following Christ, even that you put it into the neutral ground, yes. And that's where it must terrify us. It must terrify us that we, I am a follower of Christ, and you are calling me that I'm still in the neutral ground. We need to watch out of the grave danger of just being followers, because Judas was also a follower, but not till the end. There will be a time where what we are following and why we are following and uh, who we are following will be more clear and evident. And so even the people who are followers is kept there. Now quickly, the last group, which I would say is verses 6 and 7, is uh, the reason why the the chief priests and the scribes and Judas, they scheme to capture Jesus in the night when there's no multitude is, they want to please the people. They don't want to make, cause a tumult or a riot to rise up in the time of the feast. They want to catch him when nobody is around. So that once they catch him and arrest him, they don't have to bear the brunt of the people who might rise uh, who might bring up a riot because they were hearing him. They were being blessed by the miracles he was doing and they don't want this rabbi to be just taken and be arrested. They want the benefits of what Jesus is giving. So the fourth group is called the people pleasers. All these are still in this unholy ground or the neutral ground as we might call, but still lingering as a cat on the wall. And what is it that makes them to move from this unholy ground to this holy ground is what we're going to consider briefly. And uh, we will then come back to two things that this portion is going to bring light, bring light to and two lessons that it's going to help us learn. We're going to do that in the brief time that we have. But as I open this portion, as I have given few groups of people here, I want you to take note of certain important things that will be helpful for us as students of God's word to have them be answered. A couple of questions that if you are able to think with me are very profound questions. The first one is, can a child of God be possessed? If you are a student of God's word, the moment you see in verse 3, 22, chapter, verse 3, then Satan entered into Judas. The obvious question is, can a child of God be possessed? That's a very important question that you and I would need to have God's word answer for us. The second one is, can a child of God be influenced? Can a child of God be influenced? Can a child of God get into the scheme of the enemy? The schemes of the enemy. Because it seems like Satan got hold of Jesus and he led him astray, right? And fourthly, the last question is, is it, is it not Satan's fault? He tricked Judas to betray Jesus. And why should Judas, the victim of Satan's scheme, be the one to bear the brunt of the wrath of God. Because we find in verse 22 of Luke 22, it says, And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined 
but woe unto the man by whom he is betrayed. There is a woe being pronounced, a grave danger. He is on the lines to step into an eternal darkness. And how could Judas, who was tricked by Satan, be the one who would bear the brunt of getting into eternal darkness? Some of these questions are things that I would have us in the process of us understanding, ask and be answered. Now, part of the things that happen with regards to the holy covenant that we are, unholy covenant that we are talking about, is that we have to understand that there is something about the truth of what we do with the truth that keeps us in the unholy ground or moves us into the holy ground. And we will understand that and then examine the same with regards to the life of Judas. So the first one that we are to take a look at is, by default, by nature, we, or human beings, are truth suppressors. It is what we do with the truth that makes us to be clear of where we are in our lives with regards to the ground that we are in, whether it is unholy or holy ground. Come with me to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Paul was talking to the Romans, the church at Rome, and he gives what is, the, what is it that makes the Gentiles to, to be brought under the wrath of God. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The first reason for why someone who has not done right with the truth is that they are the ones who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Truth is presented to them and there is a suppression of the truth in their own unrighteousness. What do I mean by that? There is a, a truth of the gospel being presented and they would have all the excuses to not to receive the truth into their hearts and submit themselves to the Lord of the truth that he, he has been presented with. So suppression of the truth is because of two things that are being mentioned there. The first one is against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. Ungodliness. By nature, we are inclined to love that which is not godly. The Bible is so clear. It says, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that seeks God. Why? Oh, there is billions of people in India who seek so much to go into this pilgrimage and go into worship, worship centers or temples and mosques. How come you say that there is none that seeks God? Why does the Bible say so? The truth in reality is we seek after the benefits of God, but not God. We want God's benefits. That's why every child who is going for, appearing for exams, God, please bless me with my, with my exams to go well. In the moment exams are over, it is summer vacation and they're nowhere to be seen in the church. Running around, enjoying the summer vacation in whatever resorts or whatever places that they might. So is it with man. That's just a, a little boy, but beyond that, man is like that. Man wants all the benefits of God. God bless me with good health. Bless me in my job. Bless me in my family, my children should have good health. My children should have good wisdom. These are all the things that we long for. But the moment you and I long for God, you and I are to face with His holiness, His awesome righteousness, His sovereignty. He's so sovereign and in control that beyond us, whatever schemes we might have in our lives, this God is able to sovereignly let our wills not thought any of the will and the plans of God. Even the schemes of the enemy. 
they are sovereignly overridden by God. We will look at that briefly. That beyond all our schemes, beyond all our will and wishes and desires, God would let our will and wishes and desires might come to come through, but His plans will not be thwarted. And that's why we fear. That's why we don't like to draw near to Him. He is a sovereign God. Difficult to let His sovereignty govern our lives. And so, what we find here is that we come to see that we don't seek God, but we seek after the benefits of God. And that's why we are ungodly. And that's why the scripture in chapter 3, Romans 9, I mean, Romans 10 onwards, it says, which is what I was reminding, there is none righteous. Because of our ungodliness, we love unrighteousness. And there is nothing that is righteous. Even our good deeds that we do, the scripture is so clear. It says they are filthy rags. Why? Because they are tainted with evil motives. Well, the reason we are good is because somebody would call us good. It's not for the glory of God. It's for the stealing the glory of God to ourselves. And so this nature causes us to suppress the truth in unrighteousness, in ungodliness. We are truth suppressors by nature. It's difficult to come out of this state and come to truth receivers where we would not only receive the truth, but also be those that would so much we would uh, become truth knowers through the experience. Come with, turn with me to First Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, verse 4, actually. This is the desire of God. Yes, God continues to give the truth even though we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. But we should come to know the truth. We should come to become truth knowers out of experience. And we should be those that would, that would be receiving the truth in meekness. It requires humility. In our pride, we suppress the truth. We think we know more than what God can tell us. And when we humble ourselves in meekness, receive the truth, and let the truth be planted deep in our parts, we'll come to that verse, then we will see our sinfulness. Then we will see the holiness. And then we will surrender ourselves in the desperate need that we see ourselves for our Lord Jesus Christ. So in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, we read, Who will, that is God's will, is that He wants all men to be saved, rescued, to come into the knowledge of the truth. You know what the knowing of the truth happens? When you know the truth, the truth will set you free. When you and I come to know the truth, in fact, that truth that you and I receive in meekness is going to cause the Son of God to come in and set us free. Romans, John chapter 8, verses 32 onwards, Jesus was talking to these Jewish people. And he says, unless you, the truth sets you free, you cannot be free. They thought they were free. Oh, we, have, we are no slaves to anyone. Really? They were blinded to the truth. They were suppressing the truth. Externally, they were under the tyranny of the Roman Empire. They were being suppressed, oppressed. They are so, so blinded, they say, we are not slaves to anyone. They don't want to see and accept the truth. And lo and behold, Jesus says, I'm not talking about your external slavery. I'm talking about this internal slavery to sin. Romans chapter, sorry, John chapter 8, verses 36 onwards, he says, whoever is, is a slave to sin is, is not free. And so he says in verse 36 and verse 32, he says, unless the truth sets you free. How does the truth set us free? When you receive the truth in meekness. And that word of God as received in meekness is going to set us free. Otherwise, Jesus goes on to explain, you are of the, ch you are of the children of your father, the devil. He is a liar from the beginning and he lies to deceive us and to destroy us. Romans 8, 44, he says to the Jewish people and to everyone, whoever this are, 
bought into the lies of the enemy, they are those that would suppress the truth in unrighteousness and not receive the truth. And the moment we understand that and come to receiving the truth in meekness, we are going to begin to embrace the truth. And in Psalm 51 verse 6, we read about David. He learns a lesson a very hard way. This is David's penitent psalm when he had sinned blatantly of a sin of a murder and an adultery for a, such a man of God's own heart to be brought under the deception of the sin. He understood one thing. Psalm 51 verse 6, he says, Thou desirest, as he understood, as he weeps over his sin, moans over his sin, he understood what is it that made him to fall prey to the sin? It is because he didn't let the truth dwell deep in his inward parts. He read, we read there in Psalm 51 verse 6, Thou desireth truth to dwell in my inward parts. When we receive in meekness, the truth sinks deep into our being. It's not going to let us easily be falling prey to the lies of the enemy. It lingers on. This truth is going to stay within. It's going to help us see the sugar-coated candies or whatever the enemy throws at us to see the poison behind it and not fall prey to it. We come to knowers of the truth to be lovers of the truth. And you know, there is a grave danger if we are not coming to this big to this portion of becoming lovers of the truth. A man of God says, you deserve to be deceived, it seems. <laughs> In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul gives to Thessalonian church, he says, there were those in the Thessalonian church who didn't love the truth, it seems. And you know what? When you don't love the truth, God would, go, God would let you be taken for a ride by the enemy. And they will be brought under the deception of the enemy, led to the delusion of the enemy. Delusion is where you think you are in the truth, but you are way deep into the lie and the scheme of the enemy. That's exactly what Judas got into. Judas was pounded with the truth of God's word for three and a half years. And what did he do? He suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. He thought knowing the truth is not important. As long as I be just the hearer of the truth, as long as I am in, counted in the group which hear the truth, that's good enough. He thought the neutral ground is the safe ground. And see, didn't see the grave danger of lingering on the wall for a long time. You and I are called to be faithful service dogs rather than be lingering stray cats. We can be opportunistic. Judas wanted to seize an opportunity to sell Jesus. He already got his money. It's only an opportunity that he's seeking to sell Jesus. And we can be on that grave danger. So we saw three kinds of truth. Truth suppressors, truth receivers, who would then become truth lovers. Those that would let truth dwell deep in the inward parts and quickly those that would love truth. Let me read that verse for us in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's a very powerful verse in verse 10, 11, and 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 onwards. Let, let's read verse 9. Even him, let's read all together just to have us read. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 onwards. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them into strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Do you see the grave danger there? God is giving them up 
to this delusion and to be believers of a lie rather than the truth. Now, we should not just linger in those that are lovers of the truth. Good that we have moved from being those that are just knowers of the truth to be lovers of the truth, but we should be those that are doers of the truth. We read in 1 John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, it says, we are in the fellowship, but we should not be in this grave danger of not be those just who are lovers of the truth, but become those that are doers of the truth. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. We have to be doers of the truth. Is the word of God that is giving us the truths, setting us free? Is the word of God that has given us the truth, helping us to love the truth and let the truth sink deep into our being? Is the word of God becoming our portion by living it out? Those are the things that would move us slowly to this holy ground. And that is what we need to take note. And what happened to Judas? What happened to Judas is that he was counted in one among the twelve. He was there in the right count. You and I should belong to those that are counted in the disciples. It's a good thing to be counted. But, you know, sadly, he was counted but not converted. That truth that came to him pounding again and again every day that he was seeing it lived out, taught rightly was not something that he embraced in meekness. In his pride, he always wanted to make something beneficial out of this truth. The one who is the one who holds the money bag, his heart was devoted to some other god called mammon and he wanted to make the most of whatever truth that he has he would even sell the truth we read about the last days in isaiah chapter 59 that there will be days that would come where truth is sold in marketplaces it seems isn't that the christianity that you and i live in when you see the churches plagued with false teaching Rather than the true teaching, rather than the true gospel, there is such false gospel. Truth is just sold out. Money is more important. Enterprise is more important. Fame is more important. Power is more important than loving the truth and letting the truth become their portion in living it out. May we see the grave danger of the life of Judas. He was rightly counted, but sadly not converted. We are not to be just those that are counted, but we should be converted. You know what happened that he just lingered in this neutral ground, ground of being counted? That counting caused him to deceive himself and think that he's not in danger. That count, that state of being in counted led him to being in those that would be communing. Turn with me to Luke chapter 22. As we see here, he was in the count in verse 3, numbered in the 12. But in verse 4, we see, and he went his way and communed. It's not just enough being in the right place of being counted for Christ. But unless you and I are converted in our heart of hearts, there will be a time as a stray cat you would try to seize the opportunity to commune with the schemers. He communed with the people that were scheming against Christ. Unknowingly, he was bought into it. He was bought into the lie. It's not going to be big harm. You know what Judas could have thought? Judas thought, I could just make some money out of the truth that he knows where Jesus lives in the night. Yes, he teaches in the temple in the day. In the night, he is in the garden of Gethsemane. I know the truth. I'm going to sell this truth and make money out of it. And what does he want? He wants 30 pieces of silver for it. And yes, he gets it. And he's communing. 
though counted, but he is led into this communion or to be communing. He communed with the people that he shouldn't commune. Many a times, even as those that are children of God, the enemy puts around us traps to have us commune with the wrong people to fellowship with. He puts us snares to cause us to be away from the communing with God and his, with his people. Subtly he brings in, oh, just one vacation, just one day, why don't you come stay with us? Or why don't you come spend time with us? It's okay, you have Bible studies every Friday. Once in a Sunday, once in a month, or once in a year is not going to be of a big problem. You and I can become those that would wrongly commune rather than be in the right place. Now, that is not what is so sad. He not only communed, but he covenanted with them. King James translation says he covenanted with them. I'm just going to spend, hang around a few minutes with my friends. That's not something that might seem wrong or anything harmful, but sooner or later, you will be covenanting with them. That's where I draw this title, The Unholy Covenant. You and I can subtly be bought into this unholy covenant. He covenanted with them. He made a deal with them. He cut a covenant with them. He put his life on the line with them. If he's not going to turn and sell Jesus, his life is on the line. He is struck with a deal. And so we'll come to the lessons that we would learn, but take note, Judas was counted, Judas, Judas communed, Judas covenanted. And you know, at the end in verse 6, we see, and he promised and sought an opportunity to betray him. And as he seizes that opportunity, he coveted for an opportunity. He wanted to see where will be the opportunity that he can subtly, when the multitude are not there, hand Jesus over. His thought process was, they're going to arrest him, they're going to try him. Well, Jesus is innocent anyway, and he will come out clear from all that trial. So he's not going to lose much. I'm going to gain much. I wasted at least three and a half years unnecessarily following this rabbi who thinks he's giving the truth, who thinks he's Messiah. He's no close to be being any David-like Messiah. Why waste more time? I just gained something out of this treaty of following Christ for three, three, three and a half years. Sell that truth and go back into my old profession, whatever he came from. That's probably what he is dealing with in his heart of hearts. And there he was coveting to seize an opportunity to give Christ over. Now, as we see all this, I want us to close, um, come to closure as we see, there are profound lessons to be learned in coming to see what this portion is going to lead us to. Uh, before I go to the lessons, there is a, an important lesson to be learned with regards to how the bank officials distinguish between an original note and a false duplicate. Have you ever wondered how they learn how to distinguish between that? Because they have very little time. You have so many, so many uh, notes coming in, right? And you need to have, I mean, nowadays you have machines that kind of can scan few things. But you know, before earlier days, they were to manually have the knack of getting hold of a duplicate in the midst of a thousand, thousand notes that they may find. You know what? Their senses are so trained by looking gazely, looking intently, studying the true note, so much so that the moment they touch a fake note, the moment they see the fake note, they know it's something different. Why do we study the Bible on Fridays or whatever Bible study? You and I want to be intently studying and knowing the original so that when the duplicate comes, 
you have that knack and sense in yourselves to identify that this is not godliness. This is not righteousness. You know, Abraham was in that state in Genesis chapter 14. Abraham won a great victory over five kings as he fought for his nephew, Lot. Lot was captured, his properties, everything was sold. Abraham had to go and fight a war for him. And lo and behold, there were these great spoils. And there were those kings who surrendered to the victory that Abraham won over those five kings of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and the other kings. As they surrendered to Abraham, they wanted to give a tribute to him. You know, Abraham said one thing very profound. In the contrast of what Judas was trying to gain, Abraham said one thing. He said, I don't want to give anyone the opportunity to say that I have made Abraham rich. Money will keep coming and pounding at your door as opportunities where you can just subtly buy into. But he wanted to let God alone get the glory. Abraham was made rich only by God, not by the spoils of this world. That is where our senses are going to be trained to when we have an intent learning of the truth that is found in God's word. That's why we study the word of God. Not that we can increase our knowledge, but become our, that knowledge of the truth would become our very portion to save us. We read in 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, it says that they might come into the knowledge of the truth that they may be saved. You and I need to be rescued from the lies and the deceptions and the snares and the traps that the enemy lurks to put on our, on our path. You and I have not enough ourselves to distinguish the truth and the lie. We need God's word to give that to us. Now that said, quickly as I bring to closure, the lessons that we learn from this wonderful portion is that we come to see that it brings us two things to light and two lessons to learn. I also promise to give us the answers for some questions I raised. Can a child of God be possessed? And how come Judas was? And another thing that I would throw in that might give, bring us to confusion is Matthew chapter 16, we find Peter. Peter was giving his great confession. He says, thou art the Christ, the son of the most high God. In Matthew 16, verse 16, as Jesus asks, who do you think I am? Right after this profound profession, confession that G Peter makes, you know what? Peter was called something that might startle us, baffle us. Peter was called you, Satan. Was Peter possessed? What happened to Peter that Jesus calls him you, Satan? In Matthew chapter 16, verse 23, in fact, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. Was he speaking to Satan because Peter was possessed? Was Peter possessed just as Judas was? Judas, at least we read, Satan or then entered Satan. So it is an entry. The Bible cautions us, neither give place to the devil. In Ephesians 4, 27. You know what? Devil needs just a foothold. Just give one small place, he will take residence and occupy that's the way the devil works. Did Judas give? Did Peter give place? We see that a child of God, certainly we know Peter is a child of God, certainly. We also know Judas is not the child of God. He is the son of perdition. He is the son of the devil. And what happened is that he didn't receive the truth to rescue him. And so he gave place to the devil. And so Satan moved in completely with everything that he has. You might call one of us uh, for uh, a sleepover after a Thanksgiving day or after a Thanksgiving service or after a Christmas service. You know what? The church moves in completely into your home. 
and takes hold of it for a couple of days till you are tired and exhausted. And uh, that's what we do. Of course, not like Satan though, but Satan does the same. You just need a small invitation and a room is going to barge in and take over. And the truth is that in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, we find he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. A child of God cannot be possessed. Not because he or she is stronger, but the one who is in them or in him or in her is stronger. And because of him, we will not be possessed. Simon Peter was not possessed. He was influenced. The devil schemed. The devil wanted Jesus not to go to the cross. This might surprise you actually. As I myself was studying because in Matthew chapter 16, verse um, 22, what Peter did was he rebuked Jesus that you shall not go to the cross. You know what? Jesus explained that I will be going to the cross, I will be killed, and I will die, and I will be raised on the third day. And what happened is, Peter said, you shall not do that. He was under the tremendous influence of the enemy of our soul. So much so that Jesus confronted him. He says, get thee behind me, Satan. We can be influenced by the enemy if we are not careful. But we cannot be possessed. And I hope that, I, that is answered now quickly. What is the scheme of the enemy? What is the scheme of Satan? Satan didn't want Jesus to die on the cross. Satan wanted... Jesus to be arrested. Jesus was making too much inroads and making too much of the strongholds to be destroyed. In the three and a half years of ministry, Jesus set free many who were slaves to Satan. His teachings were so profoundly filled with truth that these Jewish people stronghold is being brought under tyranny. The people are coming, they're being given truth after truth every day. The master teacher is teaching. The enemy of our soul is trembling. He didn't have anything to withstand. He wanted something to be done. At least get, at least get Jesus to be arrested. Je Satan knows a lot of things that are happening. He knows what you and I are saying. He knows what you and I are scheming. He even schemes to let us in to his plans, which is what Judas bought in. Judas and Satan wanted Jesus to be arrested. The moment Jesus is arrested, the work that Jesus is doing, advancing the kingdom cause, in preaching the gospel and teaching the truth, can be stalled. That's only how far Satan's thought could go. You know, in the great providence of God, we would see in one of the lessons, is that, God uses both good and evil to accomplish his ultimate sovereign purposes. He's sovereign. Satan is mighty, but God is almighty. That's what we would learn from this lesson. As I would come to close, the two things that this portion brings us to light is, the first one is, the first thing that it brings us to light is the contrast. The contrast between the obedience to Christ and the enmity with Christ or God. There's a contrast. See, doesn't you and I have to see that our lives are truth doers. Obedience to Christ is vital to give us to understand that we are belonging to the holy ground. Is God's word working in you? The Bible says, this is how you and I know the, that we love God. How? In First John we read, by obeying his commands, by living out his word, the truth that we receive, not by just loving it or hearing it and receiving it. Yes, those are all important, but seeing it brought into obedience. The first thing it brings us to light is we need to see that there's a great contrast between obedience to Christ and enmity with Christ. Unless you see yourself and myself in obedience to Christ, which is the holy ground, you and I will be 
as enemies. Jesus Christ is a T junction, dead end. You cannot remain neutral for a long time. It's going to be only a matter of time when you will take the wrong route. As Judas immediately lurked and lingered on the wall and succumbed to going into that destruction and delusion. Jesus Christ is a dead end. You cannot say, I will be in the neutral ground forever. And that's the lesson that we learn that it brings to contrast the obedience to Christ and the enmity with Christ. The second one it brings us to light is a caution. A caution is that you and I would not have the power to fix once you and I enter into that sinful course. Judas thought it is within his hands to correct even if it goes a little wrong. We read in Matthew 26. The helpless state of Judas he didn't want that money at the cost of the innocent blood. We see almost like a repentant heart. It says repentant. Judas repented that he gave innocent blood. I sinned. I have, I have turned in innocent blood is what he says about what he did. He says, take, my, take your money back. Leave him alone. It's too late. He went too far. No turning back. Because we think we can keep that in control and fix. Even if we make one small sinful choice. It's only going to be a slide down into destruction. That's the caution that we see. A little sin is what a little leaven is enough. And in closing, the two things that brought that we, we see the scripture brought us to light, the two lessons that it teaches. The first one is, the lesson is there is a great, there's a great guilt on the sin of apostasy. There's a great guilt on the sin of apostasy. Many times we don't see the difference between the apostolic calling versus apostasy as much. It's so subtle. The apostolic calling is to die for Christ. The apostasy is they are going to see that even the truth is so dead that it would not cause anyone to be blessed. Apostasy is denying the truth so vehemently that they don't want the truth to bless them nor want anyone else to be blessed of the truth. That is apostasy. They blatantly deny the truth and reject it. Subtle difference that we see. And there's a great guilt upon the sin of apostasy. There's a great gain in the calling of apostolic ministry, but the great guilt on the sin of apostasy. Quickly, as I close, the, third, the fourth one that it brings us to learn as a lesson is that it is going to teach us the sovereign providence of God. Satan schemed to get Jesus arrested. The, the subtle giving in of Judas also brought into that scheme and covenanted. And even the chief priests and scribes wanted him arrested. And in fact, they were much more far in wanting him to be killed. It's only in the providence of God that God brought both of them together, together with Satan, so much so that he can accomplish his greater plan. That is that Jesus would be that lamb of God who would be the Passover lamb. The ultimately, they don't want, the chief priests and scribes didn't want anything to do with Jesus being killed during the Passover. They thought their plan was to get him arrested if there is any way they could, but even they were fearful to arrest him because it will rise a riot during the festival time. After all these Galileans and those that are following Jesus, who welcomed Jesus as they said, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They welcomed him grandly. They were fearful of them and they don't want Jesus to be killed during the Passover time. But they want him to be killed for somehow, maybe after the Passover. 
but God providentially brings all these schemes together to fulfill his sovereign will, to make him that lamb of God, to cause Judas to be having Jesus be sold for 30 pieces of silver and to fulfill all plans that it would be one of his who would betray him. Woe unto him who betrays him, but son of man goeth as it is written of him. God in his sovereign plan fulfills all his plans in letting their plans to come together to align to his. Who first hardened? Yes, it is Judas who hardened. Don't blame Satan for that. That's why the Bible says, woe unto him. God is not an unrighteous judge. He's not going to cause Judas to be accounted for what he didn't do. We don't have to have that doubt that Judas, oh poor Judas, he became a victim. We don't have to pity him. And when we think about all this and we learn the lessons and the light that the scripture portion brings, may it be that we are part of this holy covenant that is found in those that would be lovers of the truth and livers of the truth rather than those that would be truth suppressors and linger in the unholy covenant. Let's ask the Lord for his blessing on this one. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for enabling us to come together around thy precious word and consider the grave danger of having our lives be brought to not only hear thy truth, the truth of how thy word, which is the truth, sets us free when we love it, when we live it, and when we embrace it with meekness. But Lord, how we have this in of ourselves to be suppressing the truth in unrighteousness and ungodliness. We ask God that none of us here would belong to that unholy covenant. That you would give us grace to humble ourselves, to receive thy truth and to be those that would love thy truth. Let it become our deep inward parts. So much so that we would live it out, Father. That through it all that you may be glorified. Father, we ask for your blessing upon this word that it would become our very portion. For we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.